And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Wider Path Games, crit creators of of multiple 5e and otherwise materials, and now and now responsible for the upcoming Spark Sun campaign setting, the one and only Kevin Ferone. How are you doing today, man? Pretty darn good. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for thank you for coming on. Thank you and for braving the hell of time zones, even though it's only a one hour difference. Um, mm -hmm. It may be a one hour difference, but I still hate dealing with time zones. Just <laughs> it's a principal thing. Yeah, I hear you. So I'd like to open at the humble beginnings, as I often do around here. Walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oof. Wow. That's a great question. Uh, my first introduction to role-playing games, I actually remember very well. Uh, I was in fourth grade, and a friend of mine came in with some a few D6 into homeroom class and said, hey, do you want to play D&D? &D? And I said, yeah, sure. And he said, all right, uh, you know, Tell me what you're doing. And I didn't understand at first, but then once he described it a little bit more and said, oh, well, you have to play the role of something, I immediately uh, started playing the role of an elf. I was on a, uh, a, a road, and uh, he told me what was in front of me. He told me what equipment I had, and I started, I jumped right into the role playing right away. And he gave me a few D6 to roll every single time I said I wanted to do something. Um, no idea, had never even heard of a D20 before, uh, but I remember that moment and being able to roll the dice and choose what I wanted to do and see if I succeeded or failed, I was immediately hooked for life in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. That's how I, those were my beginnings. Which I, I can, I can certainly get, I can certainly get behind that prospect. Mm -hmm. Um. Now taking that now taking that into account, while the, while there's a fair few um, 5e five e material, were you someone who largely stuck with D and D, or did you jump around or have you jumped around between systems over the years? Uh, I have jumped around between systems, uh, but always have come back to to D and D. So um, uh, I haven't really jumped too far though i uh you know through the years you know i'm not that person who you know with every single time there's a new system coming out i'm going to look into it explore it play it um so i haven't really done uh too many different systems um played a little bit in uh fate uh uh of course um in pathfinder um but have almost always come back to D D. so we started uh, uh, me and my my brothers. I have three brothers, and when we were young, we started with uh, uh, second edition, um, and then of course moved on to three, three point five, four, five, mm -hmm. um, and more or less stayed with D and D for our entire gaming career thus far. Did you end up going down the path a lot? Have where you? Um... When it came to when it came to put, putting out your own stuff, where you were, are, where you were house ruling the hell out of it, and then just decided to make mm -hmm. it into a make it into full on books. Uh, yes, in in fact, our our first um, our first publication was actually uh, a completely unique uh, role playing game uh, built for for kids for families. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was our first publication was an entirely new uh, system that. Uh, you know, I had developed for my kids, so yeah, I was like, "This, you know, D and D is not working here. There needs to be a new system." So we built that, um, and then for our fifth edition publications, including Spark Sun, um, it kind of followed that same path. Like, 
we wanted a system that was more attached to uh, you know, the physics of the world, like instead of just being magic. You know, we want uh, a way to have a power system that does X, Y, Z. And so we created it on our own, on our own and then said, wow, this is, this is perfect for our next publication. Let's actually design this into a 5e module. Mm-hmm. Now, taking that taking that into taking that into account with Spark Sun. Now, I have ta- I have talked with a lot of people regarding regarding their particular set their particular settings and one per- one thing in particular that I always have been very critical of with D&D as a whole is this notion that you can use it to run um, any kind of fantasy just with the core rules. Mm. Uh, and especially, or in some cases, some some people believing that it's a one-size-fits-all for fantasy gaming, which, while there's certainly a lot of things that can be done, it ha- it's a very, um, it's a very Western European-leaning approach. Mm-hmm. So, with Spark's Sun, I'm cur- I'm curious what style of fantasy you're going for. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, at first glance, Spark Sun is most certainly uh you know it's it's a high fantasy setting. So everything is completely unique and real, uh, and, and and not real. Uh, it's based in a completely new world in a new crystal sphere called Spark Space, which we've created for the setting. Mm-hmm. So it is, um, it's high fantasy at first glance. And um, looking a little bit deeper, you'll you'll uncover that it's uh, set in somewhat of a traditional medieval fantasy type of world. But then you dig a little bit deeper, and you discover that there are um, these. Yeah, me- new mechanics that are being introduced, things such as uh, spark contracts, which are essentially you know physically and mentally binding contracts um, that attach themselves to an artificial intelligence that exists somewhere in the world. Uh, and so it suddenly almost crosses the line between that medieval fantasy and science fiction. Uh, so there's, there's a little bit of all sprinkled in there and it kind of keeps you guessing as to what kind of setting this actually is. Mm -hmm. Now, since you, since you've dipped into, since you started out in second edition, you'll be familiar with the concept of Appendix N. (laughs) So, given that... What sort of what whether it be books, whether it be comics, whether it be films, whether it be, whether it be t- whether it be television, what sort of materials are in your are in your appendix N for a setting like Spark Sun? So w- when you're referring to appendix N, you're referring to essentially the um, uh, you know uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide from the first edition, I think, right? Or is that is that did that come out in second edition? Um, Appendix N was in was in oh. first. Although um, mm-hmm. that brings up the question of which version of first we're talking about, and that's a rabbit hole I'd rather not go down today. <laughs> but it, it, the authors, the authors, uh, essentially um, their their inspirations but, list. I use yeah. I use Appendix N as a shorthand for that for that for inspiration yeah. and reference materials. For right. a gi- for a given um, work, it's not All too the far moved. From, it's not yeah. too far removed from the associated media list that was in a lot of World of Darkness books. Got it. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that because when I when I hear that, it makes me think of like, well, what was Gary Gygax's inspiration? Is that that's essentially what we're getting at, right? Something like this. Yeah, but but for me, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, got it. Okay, so um. Yeah, so I guess, and you're talking specifically for Spark Sun, is that right? Yes. So I wanna, I, I wanna go a little bit it, instead of bringing my inspiration from you know existing works, I wanna talk about our inspiration that that came for Spark Sun from from the world, our, you know, our lives, um, which is really how it was all born. Uh, 
one day my partner, who's my brother, was trying to break a wine glass with his voice, <laughs> you know, by getting it at the right frequency. Uh, you should have called know, the... You should have yeah. you should have seen if you could find somebody from the Boston Opera. I'm pretty sure they could help you. <laughs> right. So he he was intrigued by this. He thought he could do it, and he actually did end up doing it, and which was really interesting. But that led us down this, of course, game design rabbit hole of, well, there's these you know vibrations can affect the world and sound and vibrations, and then we dove deeper and got into this idea of synchronization, and and we're researching, you know how synchronizations happen in the world naturally. And so that ultimately, you know, of course, led us to, um, uh, you know, put on our fantasy gaming hats, of course, like we do with everything. Mm. And it led us to this, the, the core idea and concept of the game where, or, or the core concept of the magic system, which is not really magic at all, which is essentially characters' ability to vibrate and manipulate spark which is the life essence of everything in the spark sun universe mm -hmm. to form supernatural things so it's almost all of the supernatural effects and powers and seeming quote-unquote magic in the world actually is um physically possible in this world through the vibration of spark which you can think of essentially as like energy photons that exist in all things. Did did that did that answer your question of like where my you know where the inspiration for the setting came from? Yeah, and um, two things I want to get two things I want to get out of my system. One, uh -huh. um, I I really hope I really hope in the design doc somebody didn't write that Spike binds the universe together. <laughs> <laughs> it does uh, not. Oh. Uh, and two, in researching the whole sound thing, did any of you ever come across the the um qu the quiet room? Uh, I have heard of it, but what are you referring to specifically? Um, I'm referring to a a um what's known what's known as a anechoic chamber. Mm hmm. No sound. Right. It is it is basically is basically a room that they, that is used to test um used to test um audio devices mm -hmm. and it is ridiculously qu ridiculously quiet mm -hmm. to the because of because of the because of the um way the walls are set up including the floors mm -hmm. um there's no there is very there is very little sound and there's the whole Story, story or whatnot that if you're in if you're in there alone for too for too long you might go insane. Yes, I have seen this. Yeah, hmm. it, it's interesting. We so we're thinking about the different ways of being able to manipulate, vibrate, spark, and um, you know, in that kind of a room, the the manipulator that relies on sound obviously would have a major disadvantage. However. Luckily, you could also manipulate spark using wind, mm -hmm. friction, some other method methods as well. Yep. Yeah. Now, I will ad I will admit when I when I look at the ap the approach, I do get a f especially especially with the artwork, I do get a far more pulpy vibe to Spark Sun than what some people would consider high fantasy. Hmm. Interesting. Oh. I think that's good. I think that's kind of what we were going for. We didn't want it to scream high fantasy right off the bat. Yeah, if in, if anything, and this might be a bit this might be a bit of a reach. I was reminded of of some of the stranger fantasy works like Sky Realms of Jorn or Talislanta. Mm -hmm. Sure, yep. Yeah. yeah. I get that. Uh, which I'm perfectly fine with because when it comes to high fantasy, there seems to be this idea that you have to, you have to be Western European in order for it to count as high fantasy, i.e., you have to be following the um, trappings of Tolkien. Huh. And while I love, and while I love Tolkien's work to death, I resent the idea that that's the be-all, end-all that you have to follow, just be, just because, just, just because reasons. 
Mm -hmm. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah, and you know, and when I my my, uh, my reference to high fantasy was was a little bit less in the the I guess the genre and style, more just meaning it's one hundred percent um uh made up right so it exists in a world that is not real mm -hmm. in every aspect yeah like no references to earth or anything like that mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind there's a f there, one of the key one of the key bullet points that you that the kickstarter page opens up with is mm -hmm. for, is the presence of four new races and a race leveling system. Mm. So three so there's so the question that I have on that is threefold. One, how compatible are the OGL races within within the setting? Mm -hmm. Two, um what can you tell me about the about the four new races? And three, what exactly is this race leveling system? Is it like the racial paragon thing from third edition mm. yeah so one the answer is yes we have all we play tested this with all um uh other races from you know the base game as well from you know we we played barbarians and wizards so uh yes it is compatible um those races are compatible and you could put these races in any in any game um uh, you know, the, as long as you're treating our power system like magic, right, for the purposes of magic resistance and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, two, you were asked about the um, the the new races. Um, is that right? Well, that that was question two, correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, the four new races are um, we go very, very big and very small. So we have. A Graha spirit. Graha is the name of the world where um, Spark Sun uh, or the Spark Sun book it takes place. Mm -hmm. And so essentially a Graha spirit would be our equivalent on Earth at, to an Earth spirit, which is a big hulking mass of rock mm -hmm. uh, that is like half person, half rock. Uh, and they start off as medium size um, and they actually can grow to. Uh, huge size by the end of their leveling system uh, uh, at, by the 20th level, um, which is sort of just like a sort of capstone fun thing to play. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the Sparks Spirit, which is a tiny fairy character, um, flies around, um, very nimble and uh, magical. And then we have a Phaser, which is uh, an alien-looking creature. Um, Kind that of reminds me of I remember, I remember when I saw it I was mm -hmm. somewhat reminded of the Protoss from Starcraft. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that yeah, it does look similar to that. But they have these uh tentacles that that uh um you know come out of the, the, the back of their sort of hair or neck there. And uh they don't have any mouths, so they do not speak, they cannot vibrate using their spark using their mouths. They're telepathic and they um they're constantly blurring in and out of existence. So you you have like a constant ability to use what, you know, you know, from like the core books of what would be like a blur spell. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the Sindarin, which would be the the uh, the world's version of a human, uh, the most populous race and uh, somewhat of a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the, the leveling system essentially is, you know, it's a way for us to identify the fact that there's lots of these creatures in the world, which, and maybe there's some very high level uh, creatures that don't necessarily have a class, right? You don't, you can level up in the world and be like a high level uh, entity or high level person in the world without necessarily uh, having a class. It's kind of like the yeah from three point five they had um this um. Uh, they had a system where you could essentially be like a commoner and sort of level up as a commoner. Mm -hmm. and, be like that. and so it's kind of like that. And so as you level up in your, you know, as a Sundaran, you know, uh, artist, for example, and as artist is one of our classes, you can all, you also gain levels as a Sundaran uh, when you level up, gaining, you know, minor things here and there, uh, access, access to powers, um, but 
they're minor and supplemental to the core class powers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so with with that, so it looks like I was right, but not when it came to comparing this to racial paragons. It's more this the racial leveling thing is more like NPC classes. Kind of, yeah. It, it, it's it's more relevant to the world. It comes into play with NPC classes. So you come, you know, across a town of a, a phaser town, right? And the the leader of that town, while that leader is not, you know, doesn't have a class level, they are still very experienced, and they have a few powers, and they, you know, it, it, because they are a high level um, a creature in that class. Or in that, sorry, in that race, rather. Sorry. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, is it a ca for characters that that have a class? Is it a case where this, where this racial leveling would be along would be alongside it, or would they, or would it have to be a choice? No, it is alongside it. So all every time you gain a level in your class, you're also gaining levels in your race. Uh, so it happens simultaneously and. One ex uh, good example is the Graha spirit, the big earth creature that I mentioned. Uh, as you level up in your class, uh, you, you also level up in your in your race, and you get certain points in your race leveling system where you can actually add more earth onto you and you grow in size. Um, so you can come across and you know, as a character, you can level up and it will you can also grow in size. But also in the world, you can come across small Graha spirits and then very, very large ones, um, even ones that don't have a class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, let's delve into a little bit on the classes because you you have um, seven classes mm -hmm. that you're at, that you're adding it that you're adding into the sandbox. And before we before we even get into them, would it be fair of me to assume that each of those classes is going to have a few subclasses associated with them? So we we did not create subclasses with these classes. Um, uh, we did it purposely just because we wanted to focus on, um, you know, what these classes were at their core, uh, and and what we, you know, are in, in bringing to life our vision for that class. The classes themselves are also designed with a lot of flexibility um, and customization uh, in mind because all of them have access to powers, which are you can think of as as spell lists. So there is actually a lot of of customization built into all the different classes, and so for that reason, we decided not to go for subclasses for all the seven classes. Now, with so taking taking that into account, um, I did. From what it what it seems, several of them are associated with different sparks. But let's start with the altruist. And throughout these, mm. the vibe that I want to go through is not obviously not go through all of their features, but just the general direction that and the general um, play style that they're going to be leaning towards. Mm -hmm. So the altruist is actually inspired by a 3.5 class from the exalted the totally broken exalted deeds book um which was essentially the 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 non-violence uh like the oath of non-violence monk um but we we loved that class and every time we played it it was it was terrible because it was so annoying everyone you walked around stopped you know got calm and was stopped fighting and so we wanted to create a class that allowed you to um, play a nonviolent character, but have a ton of fun with lots of quirky um, abilities to use while you were not fighting or you know swinging a weapon ever in combat. So we came up with the altruist, which is essentially a healing focused class and somewhat of a support focused class mm -hmm. so next would be so given that it's about given that's about healing and support um a issue that can an issue that can happen a bit 
a bit with with some cases is support classes ha um have having a smaller action pool because they're just because they're mm -hmm. just maintaining buffs or, and the like. Mm -hmm. How how do you make it so that um so mm -hmm. that the altruist will be will be able to be active? That's that's a great question. We so we thought a lot about that. Um, we did two things. The first thing is we give the altruist this sort of delayed ability to use power. So maybe they're not. They don't want to heal right now, or they don't want to buff right now, but they can throw something up in the air that sort of delays it or builds it up for the future. So that's the first thing they can do. Um, at, actually, let me say three things. The, the, the second thing is they can actually grab, um, you know, use their reaction to grab um, things from the um, from the battlefield and store them for later, such as like stored healing. They can grab sort of lost hit points here and there and store them for later. So uh, there's other actions that can use. In addition to that, we also give them a additional abilities that can affect creatures. And one example is their truce ability. They can look at a, tree, a creature and offer that creature a truce. And whether that creature accepts that truce or rejects it, it will have implications on whether they can take violent actions in that turn or not. So they have this other really interesting thing where they can actually spread their altruist vibe to other creatures on the ba in in battle. Uh, so they've got they've got a ton of a ton of things to do. It's actually one of our favorite new classes because it's a it's a great spin on the on the support class. All right. So next would be the artist. Mm. Yeah, the, the artist is one of the most important uh, new classes in the game because the artist has the ability to write spark contracts. Um, and, you know, spark contracts essentially are, are things that um, run the world and have changed the world in, in many cases because they are contracts that you can actually uh, attach creatures physically and mentally to them and, and you know breaking the terms of the contracts can actually lead to a, a creature's immediate death mm -hmm. uh, so they can they're the only class that can write those contracts so it's a it's a role playing um, uh, aspect but in addition the artist is really it, it, they play a class that is somewhat of a um, utility and striker class because they they have this something called a sketchbook which they're constantly sketching on in on the battlefield so they they also have a, a little bit of a um, crowd control and you know they're creating you know creating objects on the battlefield changing the terrain they're you know um um building you know creating magic missiles or something like a magic missile so that that fly through the air to strike enemies so they're constantly sketching in their sketchbook and manipulating the entire terrain of the battlefield. It's a really fun um, utility character to play. Mm -hmm. So ne next in that regard would be the Beguiler. Mm. Yeah, Beguiler, uh, very, you know, they, they manipulate Neurospark, which is the spark that is most prevalent in, the cre in creatures' minds. So you can think about them as an in, you know, in enchantment magic essentially um but one thing i will i'll i'll highlight about the beguiler is they have this very unique and interesting ability called battle of wits in which they they single out a creature on the battlefield and put them into a shared trance called a battle of wits in which they battle each other in their minds in the middle of the battle both of them uh, incapacitated while it happens uh, and so, so that's a very, a very unique ability of the Beguiler that, um, is sort of a, a, a combat ability, uh, uh, that goes a little bit deeper or beyond just typical enchantment magic. Yeah. Now, the, and I'm, gl I'm glad to see that because once, because enchantment can, f could just as easily fall into that trap of having, of having someone play it very passively. Right, exactly. So the Battle of Wits lets them engage in their own one-on-one -on -one battle while everything else is going on. It's very active, and um, so yeah, we, we thought about that as well. Mm -hmm. So next would be the Naturalist. 
Yes, you could think of naturalist. Uh, the naturalist did naturally, naturally um, become the 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 tank class of um, of the group. Uh, you can think of a cross between um, a monk and a barbarian uh, with this. So attachment to the the, the graha or the earth um, often doesn't. You know, doesn't wear armor and and likes to vibrate spark using friction with their punches, obviously, uh, and vibrates a specific kind of spark called red spark, uh, which is destruction spark. So they can vibrate things to make them ex vibrate spark to make it explode. Mm -hmm. um, so really focused on destruction. Which I can, I can get I can get I can get that kind of thing. Oh, <laughs> yeah! Destroying things is always fun. Mm -hmm. So next would be the philosopher. Mm. Philosopher is very much focused on movement. Um, so much of the they are um, manipulators of nomadic spark or blue spark. So this allows them to do things such as. Um, you know, levitate and teleport, and they have interesting abilities where they can change uh, places that, uh, with with characters on the battlefield, or change all the transpose places with enemies and characters. So they um, are involved a little bit in battlefield control, movement, um, invisibility, things like this. So they can be built into a striker class, um, uh, like a sort of a sneaky sort of stri striker class. Uh, but they could also be built into something like a monk class with a very, very high movement. Um, yeah. So ne next would be the Paragon. Mm. Yeah, so the Paragon came to life when we uh, were going through playtesting and we said, man, we, we really need... It would be really cool to see what would happen if we just gave someone access to all the powers, ability to ma ma manipulate all the different kinds of spark. And so that's the, when the Paragon was born. And interestingly, we, we, so we balance the Paragon with this idea of madness where, yes, they have access to all the powers and you can mix and match powers, which comes up with some OP situ situations. However, because of that ability to manipulate all spark and the, such such a great level of power you also have to um, take on permanent madness throughout your leveling um, as a paragon uh, and we actually have an entirely new temporary and indefinite madness table in the book mm -hmm. so we love that table we thought there's such great role playing uh, opportunities here and so we made our own madness tables uh and as a paragon you take on levels of madness as you as you level up mm -hmm. and the last would be the void knight yeah and opposite of the idea of the paragon of course is the that can manipulate all spark is the void knight which does not manipulate any spark void knight has no access to any powers um and um, void the void knight was our um, was our take on a melee fighting class that was actually fun to play. Uh, so the void knight actually is able to um, it, it's a melee fighting class that is has um, a lot of. Um, movement abilities so uh they're able to very quickly shift in and out of of the void which is a plane of existence on the spark sun world not something we developed too much in this book but uh hopefully the you know the next book uh, we'll we'll bring to life the something called the void which is essentially anti-matter or anti-spark mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more so the, the void knight is a it's a melee class um with the last thing I'll say is the concept of the class is that it builds over the course of a single encounter. So it, the the whole idea of the class is that round one you have not a lot of melee powerful you know abilities. Round two you gain some because you're able to use some some abilities that open up things like void weapons to you. 
round three, you're almost as powerful as you can be. Mm -hmm. Then by the fourth or fifth round, you're so much more powerful than, you know, you would, than a, a standard melee class fighter. Um, and so it's, it's the idea is that the longer the, the encounter, the more powerful the Void Knight becomes. This, this, you, this kind of mechanic. And I will admit the way you describe it, the the thing that ended up coming to mind for me is is um th is things like things like psychic blanks and the, mm. and the um per and the pariahs in Warhammer Forty Thousand. Oh yeah, yeah, building build up uh, your your power, but it all goes away after that encounter though. So you it'll, things will you know your void weapons will disappear and. In every encounter, or whenever you activate it, it builds up very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, with that with that in mind, since you mentioned that you're not doing subclasses for e for each of these, mm -hmm. um, is it a ca is it a case where the classes are built kind kind of kind of in the way that? third edition classes were designed instead of the instead of the 5e setup uh yes a little bit more I, I think that's a fair analogy is that yeah they're a little bit more um uh yeah they're i guess they're a little bit more designed as like their own like encapsulated little world where they have access to a certain set of powers there's a lot of customization within that set of powers but um there's there's not really a need for the the subclasses i'm, gu I'm guessing that i'm guessing that f for you for you guys the the idea of the idea of doing subclasses when you, when there's already going to be a heavy amount of customization through the through the fact that all of these have some dipping into that power system was right. a ca was a case of gimmicking gimmicks yeah, it just it just didn't feel right for us. It didn't. No one wanted to sub to to, to do it to dive into the subclasses because there was so much in their class to think about. Mm -hmm. So it's like oh, we don't need this. Yeah. Now with with that in mind, I think I think this is as good a time as any to dive into the power system that you guys are utilizing, mm -hmm. and. Well, the, fir the first thing that I did notice when I was skimming through the um, sampler of the classes is you guys are using a point system instead of using slots, which, personally, I approve of. I've, <laughs> I've never been a fan of the Vancian model. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it is. it, it does use uh, points and slots. So it, it's almost a little bit similar to um, Psionics with the sort of uh, the, the point buy system mm -hmm. with a maximum amount of points or which we're calling energy points or EP that you can spend on the single use of a power, which is actually what limits your ability to use higher level powers because you can only use up to your level of energy points on a single, the single use of a power. So what it, it creates, um, it creates a little bit more swingy situations, which we all, we like um, personally, and we think is um, it's just better for the game because it moves things along more quickly often, mm -hmm. uh, because you can augment things or use more energy points on powers to make them very powerful. Um, it also expends your resources potentially very very fast, or gives you a finer. Um, sort of attunement on how you spend resources, so you can actually spend them very slowly if you'd like. Um, so, so yeah, that's that. That's um, without getting into too much detail. Uh, it that's essentially how the power system works. So you'd have access to a certain list of powers, and there are five different lists that relate to the five different colors of spark, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, several of the classes have access to only one of those uh, those lists, and you have a certain amount of energy points, which you can use to spend on powers that you know. Fairly fairly simple system on the face. Yeah. 
now taking the now taking that into account, since you brought up since you brought up psionic powers, mm -hmm. um, that brings a f that brings a few questions that that I ha that I do that I do have on that front. Mm -hmm. One of th one of them being is a is a power use um is a power use set or are or are there are there ways through ep through additional ep spending to mess around with the effects of a power uh yeah that's a great question there are um different ways through the use of ep to mess around with the effects of a power uh simply put most powers have the base power and then some additional effects or enhancements that can be bought through additional use of EP. So for the, the reason why we did that is so you could take a power at the first level and it's still useful to you at the 15th level. And we hated the idea of like taking a first level spell and then it just it just sits on your list and it's never used you know after level 6. And so almost all powers have this ability to be augmented and continue being useful to you throughout the, the uh, life of the character. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Because yeah. what, what, what I was concerned of in the back of my mind is to make sure that, pow that powers don't become fire and forget. Right, exactly. So... Um, yeah, and there's also other other aspects to powers. We, you know, um, where you, you know, y you might be able to, for a very small amount of energy, um, you know, give someone wings, right? But then you increase that energy a little bit more, and then you can give them wings and gills, right? And so, like. There's augmentations that do that increase power, increase type, increase effects. So, all kinds of interesting things happening there. Yeah. Now, taking now, taking that into taking that into account, um, a a issue that I could an issue that I could that I've seen happen whenever you have a limited resource is people. Um, being defensive with it until they until they can go Nova. How do you <laughs> how do you address that how do you address that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, so it's not like a building of resource. It's a there's a limit to there's a limit to what you can use on any given use of a power. So in and that that is attached to your level. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it you know, the maximum amount of, of energy you could use on, a, on any given power is is your class level, which means that um, any power you're using, you know, we, we scaled it so that if you're using it at X level, then it's going to be only a maximum of this powerful, um, you know. So, so there's no way for you to really, you know, use a power and have it being incredibly overpowered at any given level. Mm -hmm. Now, take now. Uh, one thing that I did notice with within the class setups is uh, the renown column. So I'd like to go mm. into renown and what that and what that is going to entail. Mm. Yeah. So renown is actually our. It was our solution to. Providing some really fun, great, active, and ongoing role playing um, uh, that's embedded into the class because there's constantly things happening in, in Dungeons and Dragons, um, you know, in, in role playing scenarios that are that are so much fun, but there's not a lot of mechanic driven um, aspects to that that role play other than oh you have a skill now or you're trying to persuade so roll some dice but there's not really a reward system that fits really well into the role playing other than oh great you you know you accomplished this this task and that's kind of a reward so the renown is is a way for dungeon masters to constantly being be uh, rewarding their players with something called renown points 
um, which essentially is their character's maybe level of fame or in infamous uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, every time you do something, the DM could say, oh, that's great. Or you talk to that person or you gave them something, take a, take a renown point or take five renown points or you save this, you know, this person or you in interacted with them. And so you're constantly gaining renown as you go through the game, but also you're gaining it as, as you level up, as you can see from the class charts. Um, and renown, you're able to actually cash in for benefits like gifts. Someone notices you and they give you some great gift and you can cash it in like that, or you can cash it in to gain followers or, you know, if you're building a clan. And so you can cash it in for different things. And as you cash in renown, it builds up in your character and you be can attain these other levels, such as you can become famous, you can become legendary. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's this whole system of of gaining fame in the world with very real benefits. Yeah. And, of course, the other side of the coin is um, clans, which mm. I'm, guess I'm guessing is going to be your, f your um, faction system at with the capstone of it being creating your own. It's actually not a capstone. You can do it from level one. You can start your, your own clan. Um, it, the clan system feeds into the renown system because essentially what a clan is is a group of uh, uh, creatures that have a shared renown. So once you join a clan or you start a clan, anytime you gain renown for doing something, you have the choice. You can keep that renown for yourself or you can announce your affiliation to a certain clan, in which case that renown goes to the clan. Mm -hmm. And so as a clan gains renown and, and levels up, then all members of the clan gain additional uh, additional benefits from that. So it kind of uh, feeds in, the, the renown system feeds into this idea of clans. And if you want, you can start a clan with your character group from, from day one. Mm -hmm. And take... And with that in with that in mind, um, when it comes to when it come, if you were to affiliate with a with a existing one, is there is there going to be rule sets for how that how that might um, affect your affect ha your relationship with other factions? It it could. So most clans in the world are actually uh, they bind their clan members with spark contracts, um, which I mentioned before. And so if you do not do certain things, such as, you know, uh, award your renown to that clan, um, then there will be penalties for that. Uh, in, in addition, the, the contract could, um, could enable you to join other clans or could restrict you to join other clans. So it's all based, it's like based on that clan and what, you know, what, what, what the characters want to do with it. Since you've brought it up a couple times, I want to talk a bit more on spark contracts, mm -hmm. and specific, specifically, how, specifically how that how they'd work and what the consequences would be if someone um, breaks them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the spark contracts are actually like a really important part of the world because they're everywhere in the continent that we introduce in the book called Visandara. Um, and basically what happens when you sign a spark contract is the spark in the neuro spark in your mind, uh, is, uh, attached to the words written in the contract, which is done by an artist using, uh, special calligraphy and manipulating change spark. Mm -hmm. And it's also attached to another entity in the world which no one really knows about called the arbitrator the arbitrator is actually an, an ai entity somewhere in the world in charge of arbitrating on all contracts and the reason why we needed the arbitrator was because we kept on diving into this idea of contracts which we loved the idea of like oh let's write a contract and if you break the terms of this contract you die right or Let's write a contract, and if you go and you know find this item that I want, then my gold will 
you know, teleport from my hand to your hand and the item will teleport to mine so we can immediately fulfill the, the agreement just using this contract. So we had all these great ideas, but it didn't really work because there's so many implications to this, right? Like you, you can write a contract that's a thousand pages long and not have come up with all the, um, all the circumstances. And so we fixed that by the introduction of this thing called the arbitrator, which is essentially an AI. And any time a contract is written, the, the spark con, um, attaches the contract words with the minds of the, of the signers and the arbitrator. And the arbitrator's job is to arbitrate on contracts. So it can understand the spirit of a contract, the purpose of a contract. And if there's a disagreement or a, an unclear term, the arbitrator decides the outcome of that contract. And it's an AI system, so it was originally programmed with a few hundred um, outcomes. So it didn't really work that well at first. But every single contract that's written, it it learns. Mm -hmm. It learns what's right and wrong. It learns what's fair and unfair. And it, it's based on the tendencies of all the contracts that are being written in the world. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a general overview. I mean, there's I could talk specifically about what contracts can and can't do but that's generally how it works mm -hmm. mm. now the one of the reasons why i wanted to delve into spark contracts is mm -hmm. because of, because of certain experiences that i've had with regarding um enforced behavior within alignments also yeah. note which is a roundabout way for me to say for me to say let's talk about the paladin problem uh-huh <laughs> yep Wherein, yep. the, since you since you had survived third edition, you're probably familiar with the whole: if a paladin, for whatever reason, isn't lo isn't lawful, then they become then they lose their stuff, which resulted in that mm -hmm. DM who would put players in fall or die situations to try and get them to become a black guard. Mm -hmm. So with co with um, contracts, how do you mitigate the po the possibility of? of contracts getting uh, getting abused or people going out going out of their way to try and find loopholes mm -hmm. so that's gonna happen no matter what and we accepted that right so like people are gonna try and find loopholes they probably are gonna find loopholes um and so we kind of just accepted that inevitability but we did do a few things to help uh i guess uh, mitigate that contracts can do three basic things they can compel someone to do something they can t teleport small mundane objects and they can destroy things including people kill people the first is compel and so a contract for example you can write a contract and say if if i do this thing then you will give me that money uh that you have in your hand and uh, if a creature does not um adhere to that compel contract, they slowly begin to lose their mind. Uh, and so they start taking on in, indefinite madness effects as long as they do not follow that the contract that's compelling them to do something. Mm -hmm. The second is that the teleporting items is very simple. It's used to teleport small mundane items um, anywhere in the world through, through contracts and you know a trigger for the contract and then something teleports. And then destroy is uh, kind of what it implies um, that you can also destroy small mundane objects, but there's one catch is that the other thing that you can destroy is a, a living creature. So you can write a contract, and when you break that contract, um, it can result in the death of one of the signers. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we we kind of I mean there will be people that take advantage of this for for sure, um, or or you know DMs that want to you know try to trick uh, their players into into uh, you know signing bad contracts. Um, but you know what? When we were doing that in the playtesting, we had so much tr fun trying to figure that out. We just said you know this we we have to leave this in because. Just figuring out what these can do in our world, it was was half the fun. Mm -hmm. And 
with that now with that in mind I believe you I believe that you also ha you um you had set you had set up a new set you had set up your own you had set up your own list of monsters appropriate to the appropriate to this world that you guys have mm -hmm. but one one particular wording that I want to delve into is abilities designed <laughs> abilities designed make some someone made someone made an oopsie <laughs> oh. make, enco make encounters fun and fast um, someone forgot the two there <laughs> oh no wow it's always something forgotten somewhere mm -hmm. mm. oh yeah so yeah I, um yeah it's a, thanks for bringing that up I, i'm gonna actually just give there are a few ways that we do this with monster abilities mm -hmm. but i'm just gonna bring up one example to to i guess describe this um we we are always obsessed with like getting through encounters fast as a lot of players are um but you know long encounters can also be fun so one example of this is with uh, a new monster that we introduced called the cloud knight uh is essentially a sentient mm, mass of spark in the form of a cloud uh and the the Cloud Knight does not have any hit points. Instead, it only has energy points, or EP, which are used to um, use powers. And um, and in when it, the Cloud Knight is, uh, takes damage or hit, is hit by something, they, instead of losing hit points, they lose EP. Um, and they can use an incredibly high amount of EP on each power they use. So, w in effect, what this does is it makes that encounter extraordinarily deadly or extraordinarily fast, uh, ending extraordinarily fast. So they use them; they essentially ex exhaust themselves while doing lots of damage really fast, and um, then they, you know, they can reform and reappear 24 hours later somewhere. So this is just one example, but we we do this a number of times throughout the book with creatures and thinking about how are we going to make, um, how are we going to make a the encounters go a little bit faster, and b introduce some kind of of role playing or interaction element within the middle of a combat or an encounter. Those are the sort of things we we're focused on when designing the monsters. So with that, in, with all that in mind, uh, before I get before I get into before I get into the next major part, I did want to go into trauma conditions. Oh yeah, is that your is that your guys's version of lasting wounds in some other games? Uh, kind of. Yeah, kind of. But it's it's really our met our um. Our way to essentially allow a, a character to stay up in battle um, because we we get rid of um, you know the idea of like being able to raise dead at level you know when, you know as a, a very like lower level power and so you know death is a real thing um, and. But when you hit zero hit points, we, we said, well, we also want another option. We want to be able to take on a trauma condition. So instead of falling unconscious, you can take on a trauma condition, which is like brain damage or nerve system damage, which lasts for an entire week before you can heal it. And so it's, you're, you're taking on a major, a major hit for your character over a, a, an extended period of time if you decide to stay alive and stay conscious in the middle of a battle. Um... And that's so. That's what a, a trauma condition essentially is. And so, it, you know, it might be something like your hit point t maximum is halved for an entire week. Um, so that, those are what trauma conditions are. Sort of add a little flavor to the to a a, a major battle scene. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, within the se within the um, setting part. An issue that an issue that can happen with set, with settings is providing such density that it's hard to figure out where to 
slot the adventurers in. Mm. So I'm, cu I'm curious in, in some part of the book if you plan to have some material to co to cover how to cover how um like story seats just to get just to give GMs an idea some ideas or suggestions on where where you could slot in people for the for the starting areas. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Everything we did in this book is really designed to facilitate that. Uh, so we have the world itself. We we introduced the the continent of Visandara, which is one continent on the uh, the planet that the setting exists, and. In that world, we have over 100 locations labeled, and um, in almost, in actually all of those locations, or almost all of them, there are um, NPCs, there are sample encounters, in, and there are location descriptions, there are flavor text. So, like, essentially, it can run as a sandbox world where players are adventuring, but in addition to that, there's also um, uh, there's also adventure hooks which actually link to other locations. So this character is actually linked to is working secretly with some character and some NPC in another location uh, to hatch some kind of a plan. And those are all called out in the different locations. So it makes it very easy for the DM to either put the character somewhere and start an adventure, or to just roll with the punches as their characters are exploring a sandbox and very easily uh, allow the, the characters to get themselves in, involved in a plot. So that's kind of how we approached designing the world. So we're providing lots and lots of, of enough detail to make it easy for the DM to play off the cuff, but not so much that it makes them have to dive into the, every location in order to run the game. Now, give now given all, given all of that given all of that, um, I also saw that you plan on including a a, a adventure within mm -hmm. within the te within the text that ranges from levels one to three. Mm -hmm. Is is that is that adventure meant meant to be a kind of, for lack of a better term, pilot episode of what one could what one could expect from Spark Sun? Uh, basically, yes. Um, you know, some of the some of the mechanics that we're introducing are a little bit, you know, th they're new, right? And they're not simple to run. It's just things like spark contracts. It's hard to get your mind around what a spark contract can actually do, mm -hmm. or or um, renown, or um, so some s things like this. So the introductory adventure it it serves to bring some of those things to life and say, oh, you know, I. Give give the players in DM a, a realization of oh this is kind of how these work in the world mm -hmm. right and so it, it sort of brings to life some of the new mechanics uh, that we're introducing in the game that's what the intro adventure mostly serves to do yeah and I'd also noticed that one of the bullet points was thirty five special items is uh -huh. special <laughs> items slash special equipment supposed to be analogous to magic items in Core Five E Yes, and we can't call them magic because there's no magic in our world. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right, and what are you guys shooting for as far as a total page count? It's probably going to be a little over 200 pages, the book. Mm -hmm. And as far as a, I know you, I know you guys are are um close to are close to hit, hitting your goal with 14 days to go, but. What are you shooting for as far as a release window? Yeah, so one thing that we do, I think, I'm proud of much better than a lot of other creators, and, and especially ones that launch on Kickstarter, is we have a much faster turnaround on our on our uh, stuff. Um, I actually just watched an episode. Someone did an unboxing of our last game, Adventure Builder, and the first thing they said was, Props to Wider Path Games because you guys got this to me. I think in four or five months, uh, and you know, usually it's like over a year before I'm getting something from Kickstarter. And so we work really hard to make sure that it the turnaround time is fast. Um, currently, the 
uh, the the turnaround time that we're um, that we're uh, stick, uh, promising is um, that people are going to get their stuff by September, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it's much faster than that. I I can I can certainly go with that, and I'll mm -hmm. be looking forward to seeing how it how it plays out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right now it's it's tough for everyone. <laughs> producing stuff and delivering it but you know there's ways and we're dedicated to getting it done mm -hmm. but with all that said i would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here mm -hmm. pleasure's all mine and anytime you see fit to return to the temple the door is always open as oh, i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> Lovely. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>